Hello, my name's Stuart. I'm the curator of the Cromwell Museum in Huntington. It's a great pleasure to be with you again for another one of our Cromwellian conversations. Uh, today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be talking with three noted historians on uh, the very knotty question of why the mid-17th century isn't better known. Um, if you look at kind of the sort of popular culture in Britain, if you look at the number of TV documentaries or films that are being made, lots of, for instance, about the Tudors or about uh, the Second World War, uh, about the Georgians or Victorians, but not very much is kind of uh, created around this particular period, around sort of the 17th century, around the period of the Civil Wars and Cromwell and so on. So we're going to be examining that today, why we think that might be, and perhaps what we can try and do to sort of change that. So do watch and hope you enjoy. So um, this afternoon, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, three of our regular contributors and friends of the museum and experts on this particular period. So um, going around the screen as I'm looking at it at the moment. So Dr. Rebecca Warren, who's um, one of our academic advisors on our academic advisory panel, who's from the University of Kent and an expert on uh, religion in this particular period. Um, Paul Lay, who's um, one of the uh, trustees of the Cromwell Museum and is editor of History Today magazine and also has written on Cromwell and uh, the Protectorate. And it's a wonderful book, Providence Lost. And Miranda Malins, who's trustee of the Cromwell Association and uh, has also written an amazing novel, The Puritan Princess, which again looks at this particular period. So thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon um, and, and giving up an hour or so of your time. Um, I know we've all talked before about um, various videos of all done or lectures with you all sort of separately. And um, I just, just wanted this afternoon just to sort of spend half an hour or so chatting to you all about the kind of very vexed question about why do more people not know about the 17th century? Why is this a sort of the sort of period of history that sort of is glossed over? If you look at the TV schedules and it's it's Nazis and it's Tudors and, uh, you know, bits of Romans and Victorians. But why are we the forgotten period? Any thoughts? Paul, you're, you've got an overview out of this whole thing, because, I mean, you've got the toy box in a way, really, in terms of history today. I mean, uh, what, well, what's your thought of perception here? I, I, am I right in the first instance? Are we, are we being the forgotten period or is that changing, perhaps? Um, well, there are some signs that it's changing. Um, it does seem to get talked about a little. I mean, that's my perception, uh, but I mean, nowhere near enough as I think it should, given its, what I think is its importance. I mean, I, I noticed just this week, we've got yet another BBC documentary on Anne Boleyn. And I'm thinking, is there anything more to be said about Anne Boleyn? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, to the neglect of the mid 17th century, which to me, is much more important. And I think the real puzzle, why it really puzzles me is that I can't think of a period of British history, certainly, that has had such a sustained amount of scholarship that's touched every area of it, um, of the highest quality. And yet so little of that has really reached um, a wider public. And one of the reasons I wrote Providence Lost but was for that reason, was to try and um, take out that scholarship um, to a wider public. But I mean, we, we do see a real neglect uh, in terms of television in particular, which is so crucial to these kinds of things. Um, and I can't really think of, you know, there's been a few series like the Isabel Hilton, The Killing of the King and various ones like that tucked away on BBC4, but unless there is um, a sustained attempt to bring this period there, um, I can't really see that changing. It needs a good documentary series, it needs a sustained period of them, and it needs to be seen in all its panorama. You know, this is a place where I think it's not just about Britain. It's, it's immensely, I, I hate talking about relevance because I think history should be interesting yeah. because it's interesting. Mm -hmm. But this is the kind of thing that radio and television and newspaper and magazine commissioners think of. You know, is it relevant? Is there resonance there? And of course, there's enormous amounts of resonance there because you're talking about 
the relationship between the constituent parts of Britain and Ireland, which is obviously important. You're talking about the relationship between Britain and Europe, which is plainly important. You're talking about Britain's role in the world, because here we're seeing the nascent British Empire emerging, and we know how resonant that is now. Um, we're talking about religious fundamentalism and religious differences, constitutional matters, the relationship between Parliament and the Crown. I mean, all these things resonate immensely. You know, you talk about the idea of show and tell. You don't have to tell anyone this. You just have to show it to them. You know, it's 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 an immensely resonant period. And it remains a puzzle as to why it is neglected. But obviously, we'll deal with that. Rebecca, I mean, uh, thinking about this, I mean, it's one of the things perhaps that sort of maybe struggle, people struggle with is, is the maybe the centrality of religion and faith to it. Is that sort of perhaps one of the issues that perhaps puts people off is the sort of um, in, a, in a very secular society today, sort of in Britain, we, we find perhaps a bit alienated by that. Is that perhaps one of the reasons you think or, or is there think, more to it than that? Yes, I think that's part of the reason. I mean, one of the... Um, conclusions I've come to in considering exactly this topic is that it's complicated. This is a period of history, particularly the middle of the century is complicated. And I think in some ways, we almost need to treat it in two different ways. The neglect of the 17th century generally is unfortunate and I think noticeable. The neglect of the mid-century, um, the interregnum, the civil war is particularly, uh, I think, sad and particularly striking mm -hmm. and one of the reasons I absolutely agree is that it is complicated it's not an easy story having said that I mean if we think about the 16th century it's not just that religion is part of the story you need to get over to people because of course the middle of the 16th century is all about the reformation I mean how how much more important can religion be in a story of a century which is constantly gone over and over and over and over that said I think the reason the 16th century, even with its important religious um, component, uh, gets brought back into the media and gets um, studied so much, uh, is because actually the religion is dumbed down in a way. The religion is easy. You go, we were Catholic and then we were Protestant. And that was the Reformation. And now let's talk about the really interesting thing, which is that man with all those wives and then the glory of Elizabeth. Oh, and Mary, who cut people's heads off. I'm really sorry, but it is a very dumbed down picture. But I think that's why the 16th century can get away with having actually a really important religious component at its heart, but still be quite appealing because the religion is the back show and the people are the front show. Mm. And I think if you rewind that into the 17th century, it's harder because the religion is more complicated. It's, it's complicated, honestly, for historians. I mean, you know, let, we shouldn't beat about the bush here. The religious turmoil of the mid 17th century is complicated for historians who really ought to know it better than they do. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that people who are not historians get tangled up and bored by it. But I think it's more than that. For one thing, it's a, particularly the religious changes are complex but short-lived. Now, I would argue, of course, that actually they have longer-term resonances and they are important into the latter part of the 17th century and beyond. But essentially, people can write it off by saying, well, the revolution kind of happened and then it stopped and we all went back. So we didn't we don't really need to engage with that. So in a way, it's an easy thing to just sort of shunt to one side. But I think the other point is that not only is it complicated, but there aren't any grand romances either. You know, there's Cromwell, he's a great figure and, and we know he's a great figure and he dominates this period, doesn't he? Mm. But you know, there are no grand romances. There are no women in great cloaks and beautiful dresses and no, no sort of high profile divorces. And, and, and there is something about the glamour of mm. a personal story in the 16th century, which I think trounces the intellectual hard graft of understanding the mid 17th century, alas, because it's, as Paul says, such an interesting and such an important period. And one that, you know, every school child, in my view, should have a basic understanding of before they go off into the wide world. But um, yeah, that's, that's my feeling, I have to say.
I mean, Randy, you obviously have written about this in terms of the personalities. I mean, are we missing, you know, to, to take what Rebecca's just said there, are we missing the soap opera element out of well, it? Well, no, I, I was just going to, I have so many points to make back to what Rebecca said, mostly okay. very much in agreement. Um, but uh, yes, the, the women, that's such an interesting point, isn't it? Because actually those women are there. They're not as high profile, obviously, as Henry VIII's wives. I mean, no one could be. Um, but, you know, Cromwell's court, you know, it's one of the reasons I tried, I have been writing about it actually as a novelist, was to almost try and achieve exactly what you, you're talking about, which is to bring that sort of Tudor excitement of personalities and relationships and the readership that just hungers for that uh, permanently to our period and say, actually, Cromwell's protectoral court, you know, was very, uh, there were lots of women in it and it was very glamorous and there was lots of art and culture and there were romances and, and betrothals and scandals. It's just that we're not interested in it as a, as a society. Uh, it's all there, it's all there. And I've heard Charles Spencer say this, that for those of us lucky enough or perhaps wise enough to choose to write about this period, oh my God, there are such amazing, as a treasure trove of exciting stories to tell. It's just that for some reason, which we're talking about today, um, you know, no one really has told them before or been interested in telling them before. And I, I, think, I think there's several reasons for that. Um, I think in, in the broadest possible sense, I always get the feeling that we as a country, as a nation, have a sort of psychological block on how we deal with this period. We mm. simply do not know how to fit it into our neat story of kings and queens who run along our wooden ruler, William, William, Henry, Stephen, Henry, Richard, John. This is the one kind of blip and, and sort of anarchic period where it, you know, the, the baby and gets thrown out with the bathwater. And I think because, chiefly because Charles II returns and we've had the monarchy ever since, we just, from the establishment down, we don't know how to deal with this period, where to put it in our timelines, to be proud of it, to be embarrassed of it, to talk about it, not to talk about it. The royal mm. family still has a tor tortured relationship with uh, the figures of this period and don't like them mentioned or celebrated. They're hardly referred to on the That's information boards at historic royal palaces. Oh, it's always so, referred to still as the interregnum, isn't it, rather exactly, than the Commonwealth exactly. or Protectress. It's the, the awful word interregnum. Exactly, Stuart. It, it, it's even its own kind of nomenclature works against it. So mm. we're all, in a sense, still singing from the hymn sheet of Charles II, really, and the whitewashing that happened in 1660. I, I think that's another problem, exactly what Rebecca was talking about, which is that for people to understand this period, they sort of think, well, OK, Parliament won, but the king came back anyway so let's just not bother looking at it mm. um, and that's very hard to explain to people that it, it mattered why parliament's victory and why the um, period into the 1650s actually does really matter and does have long-term consequences for every aspect of our society um, and I finally make a, a very silly point but I think it is true that parliamentarians in particular who particularly interest me and they're the winning side with so much com you know conflict and divisions within themselves but I think they they and Puritans also are just deemed very unsexy to people people mm -hmm. think they're boring they cancel things um they they tear things down um and they're militaristic and and you know grim-faced and they just would kill kings pull down maypoles stop parties so why would we want to immerse ourselves in their world and one of my major sort of uh, uh, axes that I try and grind with my writing is to say, no, these people are extraordinary. These people, these parliamentarians and what they do through the 1640s and 50s are, wow, they are the heroes of our national story and we need to reclaim them. I, mean, I think I think it's interesting you put your finger there on I think kind of something at the beginning where, where we were talking there I mean my, my always sense of it is, is a little bit that we have a kind of national amnesia about this particular period and I think uh, part of it is is almost it feels like it doesn't fit in within the British character or at least the kind of very Whig interpretation of history as you say you know that it's all a glorious progression and everything else but there's sort of the fact that we effectively you know be no bones about it and, and, and historians obviously can debate this as a that, you know, to some extent, it is a revolutionary period. There is a revolution of sorts. And the fact that, you know, that it's uh, such bloodletting and carnage, it's proportionally the bloodiest war in our history. And the fact that it has such implications, particularly for Scotland and Ireland, and particularly for Ireland, I think, where, of course, it's a very sensitive issue, particularly this period today. 
but it raises, as you say, and, and, and which I think all of, you, all of you talked on, it talks about issues of the nature of freedom, democracy, monarchy, religious toleration, uh, freedom of the press, which are all issues we're still wrestling with today. And I think that's why perhaps we maybe find it a little bit difficult, because actually those are things that maybe on a day to day basis we, we don't like to think about in a way. So actually, you know, the, 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 the Paul's point about the resonance of the period and actually how it, how it resonates today actually is perhaps one of the reasons, maybe arguably why some people are put off by it. It's very easy to kind of look at a sort of the, the soap opera of the Henry VIII and his six wives and go, oh, well, that happens then. And we can look at it as a, you know, fun bit of story about, um, you know, divorces and head choppings and all the rest of it. Whereas, you know, this actually just seems a little bit too much present in a way. I don't know. I do, I do agree with that totally, actually. Sorry to jump in, but that that sense that this is the first modern period and that so much of what we live with today comes from this period, from, as you say, the, 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 the explosion of printing and the press through through to our constitutional arrangements. I, I agree. I sort of intellectually, it feels almost um, too close uh, for, for comfort. Whereas we can look at the Tudors almost in a slightly medieval way, kind of Game of Thrones style and think, oh, it's all about, you know, who should rule, whereas this period is the first one that's about how they should rule. I think also, <clears throat> sorry, I was going to say, I think also that it's actually, if we take off our historians hats and put on uh, what we might imagine to be uh, television producers hats, or even uh, teachers hats, in terms of who are we talking to about this period, just going back to um, partly to Miranda's point about the Dur Pur Puritans and, and so on, um, I think if we think as they would think about how do I put this into the public domain, the complexity of the issues, I mean, why is this so resonant? I mean, Miranda's absolutely right. There are lots of resonances. There are lots of resonances with what's happening today, but they're intellectual resonances, aren't they? These are all things about how do we vote, about what do we want, what do we, how do we worship, are we allowed to choose? You know, it's really, really fundamental things about how we want to be governed and to govern in today's society. And those are, those are big, deep sort of subjects. And if you are a television producer, for example, I can quite imagine you finding it very difficult to find the character that embodies those issues. So you're always going to be telling a story, aren't you? Because that's what television is about. It's telling a story. And stories always need one person and then another person, because it's always a dialogue between one thing happening and then something else happening or in opposition, something happening. And I think the complexity of some of those really important issues about religious freedom, for example, mean that it's too easy and perhaps almost inevitable that producers or um, uh, other narrators who are trying to, who might be interested in putting this subject forward, will recourse to those simple tropes, the, the Dur Puritan. And then, well, what's, what's, what do we have on the other side? Because you need the, the yin and yang for your story. Well, on the other side, you've got the jolly cavalier. And what do we have? The religious, well, they're, they're boring and they're very um, alarming because they're a bit like the Taliban. And, you know, we all understand what religious fanaticism is. So it's, so easy, but also in a way almost forgivable for, for example, television producers or people doing that kind of trying to bridge the gap between what happened and what the story is, to end up just recoursing to these, these normal tropes. And as Miranda absolutely rightly says, Puritans sound really dull, don't they? They really <laughs> are just such killjoys. I love how, them. How do you, if you are a television producer, yeah say something about the driven passion that some of these people experienced yeah you know about the vision of a new world about you know the city on the hill that they were fighting for how do you get that across well you could do it but it, re it requires real intellectual engagement and a really fine ability to pick out the key parts of the story and i think that's ask has been asking a lot that's um i, I totally agree and i think that also almost the canvas is too broad and the uh, cast of characters is almost too wide because mm -hmm. you know in, in other periods as you say you know we have the monarch to focus on and you know their their family their spouses maybe their chief minister you have Henry VIII you have Thomas Cromwell you know but in this period if, if you set Oliver Cromwell aside to one moment and that's 
part that's a whole another conversation about how incredibly complicated he is which I know Paul has a lot of thoughts on about how we you know how he's a villain to some he's a hero to others the right claim him the left claim him who on earth is he mm -hmm. um but uh, if you put him to one side it is just this huge coalition of fascinating people from John Pym to John Lambert to you know uh, Thomas Fairfax to you know all of these characters and there's almost not too many of them, I think, for people to kind of focus in on because any one of them could be a brilliant hero and starting point for a, for a wonderful adventure story. Mm. I, th I do think, though, that um, when we talk about how complicated it is, I mean, I, I do agree with Miranda that um, there are these absolutely fascinating characters there, like Lambert like James Nail, of God's sake. I mean, you get, if you can't make a drama out of that or the syndicum plot, I mean, you've got a gun pad, but you've got all kinds of things going on there. Um, you've got things happening on the other side of the world that are quite extraordinary as well. So I think the opportunities for drama are there, but again, all the people we're mentioning are men. And I mm -hmm. thought it was interesting what you did, Miranda, in the recent Cromwelliana, when you talk about the, you have your essay on pomp and luster at the court. I mean, it's fantastic of, you know, Cromwell getting drunk there and various other scenes. I mean, there's real colour there if you're talking about television or radio, for example. But I think there's a really, really fundamental problem with conveying stuff there that is relatively recent one. Um, and that is that um, I think this comes back, to, you know, really to the point Rebecca was making about how complicated it is. And it's particularly complicated now and more complicated, I think, because the things on which this period rests, and we're talking about constitutional parliamentary history, mm. military history, mm -hmm. the history of religion are deeply unfashionable subjects. I find them fascinating. <laughs> But you only have to look back. I was thinking of the uh, Baroness Hale uh, and prorogation um, mm. scandal that was there or whatever, a controversy, whatever you wish to call it. And you realized just the lack of any kind of constitutional literacy there was mm. around that, which was exactly, which resonated so strongly with this period because we've forgotten and we're not taught anymore because it's not fashionable, even at undergraduate level, the kind of constitutional history because it's seen as boring. And military history is bad. It's, it's something that we shouldn't touch because that's bad. And religion, oh, that's bad. So we shouldn't touch that. And so you have these absolutely fascinating things that many, not just undergraduates, but people, younger people in particular, I think, turn their back on because and it's part of the problem of this idea of photo as well writing about Cromwell people think you're a Cromwellian because you write about it and that you're supporting mm. this okay and there's in a there's way that they don't do with other historical subjects do they they don't do that with but, other historical subjects no they, they don't appear to but there right. still seems to be that we're still waging those battles now that's quite an interesting thing that we are but what we don't get is the way in which it never was that simple a split. Mm -hmm. And I think we see people changing their minds, turning coats, the way people shift, particularly when you come towards the end of the interregnum and you get the restoration, you get these fascinating yeah. personal encounters between people who once were enemies, people who once were friends. And these, to me, are mm -hmm. great psychological dramas that are there. But unless, they are underpinned by this widespread knowledge, which I think was, it seems to be much more widely expressed publicly if you look at the controversies about Cromwell in the 19th century, and even in the 20th century, if you look at the way in which um, uh, the Cromwell Association, for example, sent out leaflets to, to officers talking about Cromwell there, there was a kind of idea, and Cromwell still counts for something, because we all know about the famous BBC poll where he came very high there in terms of, you know, the greatest Britain, whatever that means. Um, so there's still this hook there. There's still this knowledge that there was a civil war there. Mm -hmm. And yet there's a willingness to engage in part because I think we no longer have mm 
or many of us no longer have the vocabulary to take part in it. I think that's really interesting, actually, Paul, and I would even push it potentially a bit further than that to say, well, actually, perhaps we're asking the wrong question. I mean, we're asking the question, which is why don't we see this more often on our screens and um, on the radio and, and, and what have you? Why aren't people more engaged in it? As if the fault lies with the 17th century. But actually, there's another way of looking at that, which is to say, actually, no, there is, as we've all just said, fabulous, fabulous storytelling in this period. The fault is not the period. The fault is, and I, I, I would take away this, the word fault, the, maybe the reason is because we as society have moved away. In other words, are we that interested in politics? We have female enfranchisement. We have a relatively, and I say relatively, you know, in inverted commas, equal society. We have rights. We have religious freedom. We have a whole lot of things which are the things that were being argued about then. So we as historians or other people who are interested may find it very interesting to think about religious freedom for me particularly, as that's my field of uh, research. The idea of religious ideas and freedom I find intellectually very stimulating and very exciting, but does it make a jot of difference in my life normally? No, it doesn't. And it does still have resonances with today. But if I take off my historian's hat and say, well, if actually it's of intellectual interest to me, why on earth would somebody who isn't a historian really care very much about that? So in a way, I think part of this discussion actually might be leading us to, to re-articulate re the question and say not why is the 17th century not very interesting, but why aren't we very interested in the 17th century? And is the answer to that? Because actually our concerns have moved on. I mean, our concerns right now in August 2021 are about the environment, aren't they? They should be about the environment. They should be about global inequalities. They should be about hunger. They should be about repression. And I think in some ways, maybe that's part of the answer that making, bridging that gap between what was happening then and what, not our interests, not in this group here, not in our hopefully uh, audience's interests, but in the wider world's interests, maybe these things aren't as relevant as we think they are. Well, but I think, oh, sorry, Paul. No, I, I think I'm... there are other, there, there, are, there is a lot in what you say there, Rebecca, but I think we can get, I think we can get slightly seduced by this concept of relevance, which I hate as much as Paul does, um, in the sense that if, if we look at other periods, which um, if, we, if, we, if we move away from Britain and look at, in, in, at the world, uh, the Americans are fascinated by the American Revolution. The French are fascinated by the French Revolution. You know, are we, are we saying that they're still battling today over exactly what they were battling about in, in the terror or in the French Revolution? And similarly in America, you know, ha haven't they answered a lot of the, 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 the problems of, of, you know, the, of the early history of America now? You know, so I, I don't think we can say, and similarly, um, you know, over here, why do we love our medievals, our Tudors, our Wars of the Roses? What's the Wars of the Roses got to do at all with modern life? So I, I don't think we have, I don't think we have to make those connections in order to, to answer this question. I think it's part of the answer. I agree, Rebecca, but I, th I think it's only part of the answer. I, 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 I agree. I, sorry, sorry, Paul. No I was going to say, I think, I think it's interesting just to pick up a couple of things that sort of are raised there. I mean, it, um, I think it's interesting this period with one of the things or one of the arguments that I we, we, we make about it, it being very complicated and therefore it's difficult for audiences to understand. And I think that holds to a point. But then you look at, for instance, you know, one of the most successful television programmes in the last few years has been Game of Thrones, which people stuck through eight series with labyrinthine plotting, the world's most vast cast of characters. And they stuck with that. And I yeah, think it's a matter of, if, if, they, if they, yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you can introduce us some more female characters, which we know we've got the great female characters, they're just not introduced in the popular imagination. <laughs> and a bit more sex, there is, you know, the MP, for instance, who got thrown out of one of Cromwell's parties parliaments for having it away in the speaker's chair you know if you have a bit more of that then then you know fine we've got that but I think uh, in more seriousness I think going back to what Paul made a point so earlier on I think it's interesting from the visitors who come into the museum and from 20 years of working in museums and heritage there's still a resonance with this period more than any other with people in the sense that uh, people will come through the door and they'll tell me whether they're a roundhead or a cavalier or not 
-hmm. And I don't know any other period of history doing that. So just going with Miranda's point about the Wars of the Roses, you know, as somebody who does a living history events, the Wars of the Roses, yes, there's some people who are, you know, Richard III Society or whatever. Um, but, you know, the, the, you won't get people coming out, oh, I'm a Yorkist or a Lancastrian. You know, you don't get that sort of identification from other periods of history because something about this particular period where people still feel that they are tied up with those issues even now that they particularly identify now the, the reasons for that are quite often are rather strange and you know oh, i want to be a cavalier because i like the costume and then we have to have the conversation about actually you couldn't really tell the two sides apart and the floppy hats and feathers is all a myth but um you know it's interesting how people feel that they have to take sides with this probably more than any other period in history still in the because popular imagination I mean, I, I, I think that's right. I think, I think that's absolutely true. And, I, and I'm astonished by the way in which people still do adhere to those identities or claim that they adhere to those identities even now uh, and quite vociferously. But I think maybe it's got something to do with the fact, I mean, we've mentioned the American Revolution and the French Revolution. I think they're perceived as points in which after which things change, they're fundamental breaks. After the French Revolution, France becomes something different. After the American Revolution, the, the United States becomes something and it, and it has its own identity and it creates its own myths that forge that identity. There are, there are very, you know, they're absolutely important. I, I don't think we should necessarily see myths as negative. They can also be positive in, in giving something a kind of uh, an identity. Whereas I think, and this comes down to this, I've always found it a problem when we talk about the British Revolution or the English Revolution, because what do we mean by that? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't strike me as a revolution in the modern sense that the French Revolution, for example, is one, or the Russian Revolution, which is a break. It seems to me to be highly ambiguous. You know, it, it's the old Austin Woolrich thing about um, the turning of the wheel. Is it a revolution like that where it's a return? And although it's never the same, after 1660 and eventually there is this division but you know the division between church and chapel remains for example that dissenting tradition grows if anything during the the 19th century and becomes more articulate and, and politically powerful um, and you have the kind of weak Tory balance there we're still living out those things. We're still playing out those divisions to some extent. I mean, of course, they've changed, but we can see them rooted in that period without being concluded in the way that they were in France or the United States. Um, and I, I think that's that seems to me quite an important bit about this and why if Rebecca's right, and I think she is, about this retreat from politics, which seems to me to be a real thing, certainly party politics in that kind of way, or parliamentary politics, then perhaps there's a reluctance to return mm. to this if, if it doesn't, if these resonances may be, may be too much. But again, on the, on the issue of environmentalism, I think what's extraordinary, I mean, I always think about this when I read Bear Worden's book, Roundhead Reputations, about the historiography, or Richardson's book on that, is the way that each uh, generation reinterprets this period anew. It may be a lot of people reinterpreting it anew, it may be just a few of us, but it's always happening like that. And the environment point is a really interesting one because it was a time of shortage and famine and there was obviously the damage that was caused through the conflict as well i mean this was a period of suffering and of course famously plague as well which was there and and, and particularly of course in the 1660s later um and so these two are things that, that we can look at and which and which resonate now and of course it's also the age of hobbes uh, and hobbes seems to me to be the kind of philosopher de jour you know this is the time of Hobbes that we've done I mean look what we've given up uh for the case of security I mean it's astonishing that people would have been in lockdown 16 months ago if we'd suggested this two or three years ago we thought we'd all gone mad and yet this is what happens uh when a crisis which is whether it's an epidemic or it's 
plague or environmental crisis, which is plainly happening now. I mean, I don't think there's much dissent about that. And so we're entering a kind of Hobbesian world. And again, the 1640s, 50s and 60s resonate. Mm -hmm. and, and so again, we have this puzzle as to why people are making the connection. That's really yeah. interesting, Paul. And I wonder if that's, we're in the thick of it now, so we're not gonna see it quite yet, but whether that will lead to another period of sort of uh, reinterpreting this period in light of what's happening to us today. Um, as you say, in, in the way in which, you know, every age makes its own Cromwell and makes its own and sees the 17th century through the lens of its own preoccupations. And that's what Rebecca was just talking about as well. Maybe we're entering into a new phase where actually, as you say, the debate, the Hobbesian kind of debate, the Lockean debate is actually going to be, be more relevant. And maybe that's something that we, you know, we need to think about as sort of communicators of this period. But, but I think again, what you said, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, but, but again, this depends upon us if we are to enter in that debate, mm. having that vocabulary. Yes. And, and that's my great worry about this is it becomes a kind of spiral where we, we don't want to talk about this period. Mm. But then the less we talk about it, the less we're able to talk about it. And it becomes a kind of death spiral so far as the subject goes, and and comes, certainly as far as the, the general public goes. And that comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, which is that I, I genuinely think that as a, as a country, we have a kind of mental block on this period. We're frightened of it, I think. We're mm. frightened of it. We, we don't know how to talk about it. We don't know whether to celebrate it or to be embarrassed about it. We don't know who was good. We don't know who was bad. You know, that all sounds silly, but that's as a nation how you how you process history and make myths about it and stories about it and teach it to children, you know, and, and, and we, we don't know how to do that with this period. And, and as you say, you know, about when you're someone who writes about Cromwell, I have exactly the same experience as you, whereas I'm always asked by people, oh, was he good or bad? Or, you know, do you therefore think, you know, he was a good ruler? Do we need a Cromwell today? And I would look at people slightly baffled in the sense that, you know, you don't ask that of people who study other periods or, or, you know, the important question isn't whether he was good or bad, but why does he matter? Why was he important? What's interesting about him? Yes, people very rarely say, oh, Henry VIII, was he good or bad? Yeah. I mean, at the moment, we currently think Henry VIII was an absolute monster. I but, you know, of course, for most of history, people have been sort of just accepting that Henry VIII was a jolly good chap. You know, he was a great king, wasn't he? Yes, he chopped off some heads now and again, but, you know, he was a big big bloke and he and he and everything was fine so nobody nobody says to Henry to to you about Henry VIII was he good or bad and I think that's I think you're absolutely right and I think it highlights in a sense a, a point that I would come back to which is if you are trying if you are not a historian but you're trying to put this to a wider public how do you how do you find the story in it without dumbing down the issues and I do I do have great sympathy for people in that because I think um and, and Miranda you chose a particularly I think creative way I mean Paul this is nothing to do obviously your book was a com on a completely different level um in the sense of you were thinking of an entire period but your Miranda's angle into thinking about the family and how that would have felt she she found an angle for looking at these topics through a particular person's understanding of what's going on and I think that was a brilliant angle and I think it's a shame that more there isn't more creative understanding and engagement from commissioners and from other writers and so on with sufficiently um, sufficient understanding of the complexities of the period that they can do exactly what's necessary which is take a single angle and say through this I can tell something of this complexity Mm. And why that is may simply be down to the fact that very few people studied it at school. It's rarely on the curriculum, so they don't come to it, do they, with an understanding. We all have an understanding of the Tudors, because if you didn't do it at A level, you did it at O level or GCSE. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't do it at school, you've got to put a lot of heavy lifting, in a sense, into it to really grasp what's going on before you can stand back and say, right, my narrative through this, my way of explaining some of the complexities, but also some of the fascinating things that are going on, is through this person or through this sequence of events or through this theme. Mm -hmm. And I thought the, um, so the only one I've ever seen, I think, that has really, I think, struck a resonance with me was The Devil's Whore. Mm 
Mm. And the narrative they found in that was to take an individual bystander, if you like, this woman who was peripherally mixed up in it, and in a sense, take that story of how does one person who is on the edge of events, but not moving events, she's not a mover and shaker, how does her viewpoint of what's going on get changed in the kicks and knocks of this period? And I actually thought that was rather brilliantly done. Now, of course, partly it's because it's quite heavily on religion. So I, li I liked that. Um, and for me, I thought actually it was spot on in terms of getting at some of the sort of grottiness of the ideas and the reality of life then. But I don't think we're seeing enough creative yeah. engagement from producers and writers with finding that fine angle um, into comple complex events. Totally and I think that's because they don't come with that background. I totally agree. And I, it's, it's very, thank you very much for a very kind words. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that entirely, you entirely in a nutshell explain why as a historian, I turned to fiction to try and find a new angle and a new way to get this period to a wider public. Exactly that point, which is to try and find, you know, a way in that might be more tempting for other people. Um, but 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 I, I completely and utterly ag agree with you on, on, on everything that you just said about finding these stories. And I think the problem, as you say, is that so much groundwork has to be made by us who are trying to communicate this period publicly, because there's such a lack of foundational knowledge in people that they have from school. I mean, I, you know, it, with, with my novel, most of the hard work of editing was in the early chapters. And it was because I had to get in so much background information in to tell people what they needed to know, even to understand, even to enjoy a sort of fictional plot in this period, but without it seeming heavy handed. Whereas if it was, if it was a book about the Second World War or set in the Tudors, you wouldn't need to do that. So I, I totally agree. And I think as Stuart says, not to be a pe I'm not a pessimist about this actually I think that the 17th century is having its is having a real injection of enthusiasm right now I feel like we're on the crest of a wave of, mm. of, of towards in more interest in this period which is really exciting I think it's it's it, it's it's important for all of us to get behind that and push it forward um, but I do think it's got to be a, a kind of broad approach as Stuart's alluding to it's got to be something that br brings in um, popular and public his history, but also novels, films, radio programs, exhibitions. It's a whole cross-cultural change that we need to bring this period into the into the public eye. You yeah. know, one 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 great history book isn't going to do it, or one great you know, it's got to be a whole whole effort. Now, it's oh. interesting we're, we're we're talking about this, sorry, Stuart, um, because. Uh, Maybe it has found its moment because I mean we know that Robert Harris is writing a novel on the period, yep. which is usually a sign that um, it's uh, something shifting there. Mm. But um, I wonder. I mean, I agree about the uh, the Devil's Hall. Very uh, very interesting from from a religious angle in particular. But I think the one popular work that's set in this period, and it's rather schlocky and exploitative but I do think it gets something of an enchanted world is the Witchfinder General, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is, I mean, you can talk about the plot and various other things and, and, and obviously uh, people would question the um, image of Matthew Hopkins that's in there, but I think in terms of the atmosphere that's there, it points towards something that when, when I've discussed with people this period who haven't come across it before or don't know much about it. They're rather, um, well, shall I say, enchanted by this enchanted world in a way. This is a, this is a different kind of world. And we've talked a lot about resonance and I think quite rightly about, you know, what we see as uh, the parallels that we can draw between that world and this. But I think maybe we undersell, in a way, the difference. Uh, and, and that in many ways is as fascinating to me as those parallels, because after all, that's what appeals to me about history, not just the, the 17th century, is how many different ways humankind can be. Um, and we see, even though it's this country, uh, which we live in now, it's a very, very different place 400 years ago, even though we can, we can, see, um, we can see those resonances. And I wonder if, in a, in a way, that's 
that's the way to do it. The number of people who talked about Naylor and his worldview and the people around him and the trial and the clash between you know, Presbyterians and independents and everything else, and trying to understand the concept of providence, for example, which is you know quite a compelling thing. And I've also seen it done as well, I think confronted probably best this whole period within this idea of a myth during the Second World War, I think with T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets and particularly Little Gidding, where there was an, an attempt to create some kind of positive mythology on that. But again, we come back to this point that, that those illusions had to be recognized. And if even the illusions can't be recognised, then you can't make them. And that's yeah. that's uh, the kind of catch-22. I think it's interesting you pick out on which find a general there. It's interesting there's quite a lot of the popular culture depictions of this period, certainly in the last 30, 40 years ago, certainly in terms of film, actually seem to be through horror films. Yeah. Um, we know which find a general, a field in England recently, which is a deeply strange film. Yeah, the witch, which is okay, set in New England, but again is very much this of this period and of the Puritan family. Uh, even Fanny Lie Delivered, which was uh, the other year, which are kind of you know, uh, we thought well, was the first time I've ever seen on film the Ranters. So, um, which was a a whole thing around that, which I thought was interesting, but. Yeah. A lot of these also play into the stereotypes in the fear period. And are we also not only battling against um, insofar as uh, sort of, you know, people's, uh, you know, a, a lack of awareness of the period, but where they are aware of it, that most of what they're aware of is the stereotypes and myths, sort of, you know, cavaliers and roundheads and black clad purists. And, that was the point and, that I was going to make, actually, Stuart. Yeah. And it's really interesting, you're, as you say, Paul's mention of the witch finder, finder general, because I have a real sort of problem with this which is that as you say I mean amazing amazing films and amazing kind of conjuring but it's it's just as Stuart says and it comes back to my psychological block point that that it seems that for creatives for most films and 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 efforts to get into this period can't come at it straight they've got to come at it seemingly at an angle it's got to be through horror it's got to be through genre it's got to be through horror it's got to be through kind of psychedelic kind of like a field in England sort of stories. It's got to be through witch, witches, witch hunting, witch finding. You know, we don't seem able to just tell set stories in this period with normal people having normal conversations and normal reactions to things and normal relationships like we know that they that they did. I mean, Fanny Lie Delivered was actually a huge disappointment for me. I went to see it at the cinema and the first sort of three quarters of it is really interesting and social and, kind of gets the period really beautifully and then it turns into a horror film and I was like oh great you know none of I've studied this period for 15 years and I study amazing people with with such conscience and such drive and such purity of thought in many cases and and, and so, you know then they're not characters in a horror film they're real living breathing people struggling with these huge questions and can't we just take them on their own terms for once I, 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 have, I have a suggestion for subverting that form, a uh, proposal for a comedy film, which should basically be about the syndicum plot. <laughs> I mean, they are basically the keystone cops of assassins. They are the world's Perfect. worst bang of, gang of assassins. You could write a brilliant comedy basically around, uh, almost slapstick comedy around the sort of the whole set of yeah, syndicum plots. Different genres, yeah, sounds good. But, but I think that, that, that is the problem, is that descent into the, the horror genre or whatever, whatever genre there is, because unless you do just grasp the idea that, you know, the fifth monarchists believe what they did and had a rational idea of this, you know, these were rational beliefs within the, within the perspective of, of these people. They are not, it's almost as though there is this feeling that people have been taken over by a kind of madness mm -hmm. rather than engaging with a, with a, with a rational world, however irrational it may seem to us. I mean, this is also the period that forms, you know, the, um, the Royal Society where you have this, this endeavor and you see this, this great elision between religion and science that is, that is wholly part of this period, a connection that's actually rarely made um, uh, to, to the wider public there but which is absolutely crucial you think of something like um you know lucy hutchinson's engagement with lucretius and <laughs> uh, you know so important that 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 um 
milieu that she belongs to, you know, this wonderful defense of her husband and, and the cause, and yet also is involved in this um, absolutely crucial translation that's important to Boyle and Newton and people like that. And it's, we, that, that you're absolutely right, Miranda, and, and again, this comes back, I'm, I'm sure Rebecca's got something to say about this, about this, this religious idea suddenly stopping, that that's where the revolution happened, is we stopped being mad about religion and we went to science, whereas in fact those two are intrinsically interlinked. And it's so important what you just said, just, just super quickly because I know you're going to say something, Rebecca, but this is where we always come back to 1660 as this major issue, because as you say, the link between science and rationalism, that's happening in the 50s. You know, and the, 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 me, the men who create the Royal Society are meeting under Cromwell and are being, you know, patronised by Cromwell, by Edward Montague, who ends up being the Earl of Sandwich. And I, I, it really frustrates me that the Restoration is allowed to be, you know, um, all, all enlightened and with peeps popping in and out of coffee houses and having nice scientific conversations. And then you go back to the 40s and 50s and what do we get? Horror and, and, and madness and, and pre, you know, kind of primitive peoples having horrendous interactions. And I just want to, you know, what, what I always try and get at in my work is continuity. These are the same people. Edward Montague is the same person when he's serving on Cromwell's Council of State as he is when he's Pepys's mentor a few years later. Pepys was there for the execution of Charles I. These are the same people. So we, we emphasise the watershed of 1660 far too much and massively to the detriment of what comes before. And I think this is partly a, a fault, um, if fault's the right word, of historians in the past as well, that one of the problems we have in the 17th century is very much a very strong sense of periodization. Yeah. So how many of our books on our shelves stop at 1640? Yeah. Well, almost all of them, almost all of them. And then there's a cluster of books on all of our shelves, which cover those 20 years. And then there's a whole lot more books, which all start at 1660. So in yeah. a sense, we've made the noose that's now hanging us because actually we've failed as historians. And I say we loosely, but in the past 200 years to really do, as you say, Miranda, which is something I'm very interested in as well, which is pull out the continuities and see a much more nuanced view of what's going on in the mid century compared to these underlying, these great underlying themes and um, uh, views that people held in the 17th century, which didn't stop in 1640, and they didn't start again in 1660, and they were all uh, pushed and shoved and twisted and tweaked by what happened in the mid-century, but people carried on being people, didn't they? They ate, they loved, they died, all of these things continued, and in fact, if you tried to pin down what changed in the, in the mid-16th, the 17th century, not just what changed afterwards, but pin down how different society was, yes, there are a number of very obvious things, but there's a whole lot more that just made society just the same as in 1630 and just the same as it would be in 1670, and we, I think, as a profession loosely have failed to be more nuanced about how we talk about the 17th century and in a way I'd like to almost be interested in just sort of enlarging the conversation at the moment about it's not just about the mid-century is it it's actually about the whole century why do schools not jump on the 17th century and say this is what we need to teach because this is the the fundamental, getting the fundamental way into our society now, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, the Reformation mattered. Yeah, of course it mattered. It mattered in all sorts of ways. But hey, it didn't matter more than big political debates about how do we want to be governed in the 17th century. It didn't matter more than the astonishing scientific discoveries, which, as Miranda absolutely rightly says, are starting to cascade from at least the 1650s. And of course, before then, they, they were already, you know, the 17th century was a powerhouse of intellectual thought. Why are our schools not saying, if you want to understand today, if you want to understand relevance, if you want to engage people, it's the 17th century that gives you everything you need. I mean, I've taught courses stop, where stop. I've just picked out all sorts of different themes and gone, right, we'll do agriculture now, we'll do housing now, we'll do poverty the beginning, now. We'll beginning do, of the press, the journalism. Beginning of the press. The beginning of the coffee house culture you know this is all about what do people eat how do they you know things which are so relevant so why is the entire century not just the mid-century why is the entire century just ignored and the periodization is such a good point and i mean it struck me when i was a student that because i mean my i i, I deliberately focused my phd 
on the men, the, the, the politicians who tried to make Cromwell king in 57, but tracing their careers way into the 1660s and looking at how they survived or didn't survive under Charles II and why and what arguments they made in their defense. But I was exactly trying to answer that problem. And we had, we had a conference around the same time about change and continuity in 1659, 1660. And it's, it's a drum that I always beat. It's a, it's a major thing that I'm trying to achieve in my novels is to say, look, Cromwell's court was actually quite a lot like Charles I's court and quite a lot like Charles II's court. And actually there are a lot of the same people knocking about. So yeah, let's let's bring back some of that continuity. Let's 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 break down those period periodic barriers, reclaim the whole period as, as you say, a one-stop shop of brilliant history that teaches everybody everything they need to know, and you know, get it out there. I, mean, I think I think it's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think it's almost a deliberate uh, barrier that's created. You could argue by the restoration itself, because everybody yeah. immediately wants to go at that point. What happened before? Nothing yeah, to do with us, Gus. We're we're all on the side of good King Charles, you know. Yeah, it's uh, you know, literally, literally. From Charles II's hymn sheet, as I say, this is all. Yeah, li 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 literally and metaphorically, the act of oblivion has been yeah. sort of passed there, as it were. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to ask a slightly mischievous question at this point. Uh, it, it, is Cromwell part of the problem? Is he too paradoxical? Is he too frustrating? Is he too complicated? Is he too controversial? Um, you know, he, he, he's, 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 is he actually a figure that sort of actually uh, should be engaging people for this period or actually do a lot of people find him quite alienating, do we think? Don't all rush I at think, once. Um, I think he's, I think <coughs> that although, and I know Miranda will, will agree with this, he is a complex figure. But actually, I don't think Cromwell is the problem, not really, because I think he's one of the saving graces in a sense that he is at least a figure that you can really say, yeah. Here's somebody through through which his actions we can start to understand. After all, Cromwell wasn't the revolution. Cromwell wasn't what was happening. He was simply kicked around by it, picked up ball and ran for a bit, you know, drop kick and then off he goes. But it, this was a bigger fundamental series of events in society. And he is a great, I think, a great gift to historians, to novelists, to filmmakers, to anybody who's interested in telling the story, because he is something, first of all, that people have heard of. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that actually people, rightly or wrongly, usually wrongly, do have already views on, even if they know nothing about him whatsoever, they'll still yeah, have a view. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I don't think, no, I, I, I don't think, although he is complex, I think in a sense, his story is something that is both magnificently unique but also quite understandable this is a man who who one way or another superseded the the class system to get to where he was going extraordinarily at the time but that's not extraordinary for us so that's something you know we can actually understand and this is a man who was ambivalent about certain things this was a man who had certain fundamental beliefs, but beyond that wasn't too bothered about detail. And I'm thinking in particular about his religious views and so on. It seems to me that those things are very resonant and very understandable by Quite modern day in a way. If you were an early 19th century um, uh, reader, for example, or if you were part of the, um, the Oxford movement in 19th century Britain in Oxford or something, the idea of a man who could just say, well, religious forms don't really matter. And I'm just interested in people's godliness. I mean, that would have been utterly perplexing, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But surely to us today, that's something we can all go, yeah, okay, I can get this, I can get with this, I, I understand what you're doing. It, it, it's, it's very the very modern concept of spirituality, where people say, yeah. you know, I'm not religious, but I'm a spiritual person. Yeah. You know, it's, uh... <laughs> In many ways, to me, I think as a figure, although he is utterly extraordinary, don't get me wrrong, I'm not in any way saying, oh, it's just like us, but actually in a funny way, he was just like us, wasn't he? That actually we can look at whole aspects of him and think, yeah, People do dreadful things and are still good people. He's got an haven't we all dream. seen that? You know, people do dreadful things but are still in other play in other ways good people. That events force you to do things you would rather not have done, but realpolitik makes you do them. It doesn't mean that you're an out and out monster. I think actually those are those are messages that people today do understand, don't they? It's the mixture of the extraordinary and the everyman in him, isn't it? Yeah. Which actually you can play up either and, and should be, as you say, a brilliant way in. Should be, I say. <laughs>
I think he, I mean, I agree with you about the way in. I mean, it, it, it's the obvious way in because he is the one figure in this period, apart from Charles, who everyone knows. I mean, but to a certain extent, in the way he dominated the politics, certainly of the protectorate, he also dominates our view of it. So there's a lot of very important people there in the shadows, not in particular people like Lambert you've mentioned, but I mean, there's, there's God knows how many Montague, you know, I mean, there's, there's lots and lots of people who are hidden by this you know, vast presence. Um, and what is actually interesting in it is, I'm not sure how complex Cromwell actually is. I find mm. him quite a simple figure in some ways. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, his relationship with, with God is mm. strikes me as very, very simple. And again, we might interpret his godliness has been quite capacious i mean I, I think he's a real seeker after liberty um but in a way it's just not uh, i'm not sure it's that engaged i think it's very very simple I, I don't find it particularly complex um and he's a sort of person who cuts through a gordian knot rather than um deals with the situation in all its complexities but i think worse than that he does hide this incredible array of characters yes. that if we want to imagine the drama and there is the very real drama of this period we need to incorporate those characters back into it yeah. and then it That's strikes me I mean Lambert in particular is a classic example mm. of a really significant historical figure who should be so much better known is and, complex and he's really quite you know i always call him the kind of cromwellian cavalier which he is really i mean there is something of the yeah. about lambert but there's so many other characters as well, and well lambert's that's, 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 military, sorry lambert's military stand in 59 and in, in 60 i mean no one knows about that there's always yeah. a sort of that's another fourth little civil war really that curry that it's, no one really knows about but the point you just made paul i'm so so fascinated to hear you say that cromwell's a simple man i love that because mm -hmm. That is so sort of fresh as a way of looking at him. And actually, I, I sort of feel similar. I, I feel Cromwell's voice is very strong. Mm. I mean, in, in, my, in my novel, the one character I had to do no work on was Cromwell because he exists already in my head so strong, mm. so powerfully. I mean, he just said his lines to me, whereas all the other characters I have to work on them and brush them up and look into them and work them out. He's just there. And, and I do agree. I mean, he, he is so powerful in that sense. But I always think that he's credited he publicly. He's almost credited with too much power and too little influence. So he's thought of as being dominating this whole period. He single handedly wins the war. Apparently he kills the king single handedly, equally, apparently he cancels Christmas um, also, apparently. Um, and he, he's, he's basically this kind of tyrant, which, as you have said before, Paul, you cannot be in this period. You cannot be a 20th century dictator in this period because me the infrastructures are not there. But similarly, so we give him all this power. And when we when people talk about the period, he's mixed up with Thomas Cromwell. He's blamed for all the destruction of, of churches or, or any vandalizing is, is laid at his door when he didn't do it. So he, he, he's kind of meant, he, he's, he's given the power of having rap controlled this whole period, which he didn't. And yet he's credited with no lasting influence or importance. So it's like, well, which is he, popular culture? Which is he? Is, is he it's, somebody who changed everything forever because he was so powerful? Or does he not matter at all because he wasn't really anybody? Uh, it's what I refer to the, as the omnipresent Oliver um, mm -hmm. syndrome is the fact that, you know, he, he's been everywhere, he's done everything. Yes, I mean, yeah, awesome. there are lots of people who are going to get brushed out. You know, the, the one I, I bang on a lot of people about, obviously, with regard to the Civil War is obviously Fairfax. You know, it's sort of poor old Tom Fairfax gets airbrushed out of the first Civil War, despite probably being more responsible than anybody else for Parliament's victory. But anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think you can argue that uh, you can see Cromwell becoming this dominating figure because he is the one we've all heard of, and that's been going on a long time. And I think, you know, for an entire generational thing since 1970, that's not been helped by the film Cromwell. You know, the, the Richard Harris film, there's a very long shadow, um, the number of people who, who, well, actually, there's two things that, I, I, that actually people come in as use as their reference points when they come into the museum with regard to Cromwell. Uh, one is the Richard Harris film, the other is the Lady Bird book, 
Oh yeah. <laughs> Lady Bird book on Cromwell, which uh, you will have that there is, a, you know, an entire generation or in fact several generations from when that was published in 1963 to when it was still published well into the 80s. Who their, their people's knowledge of Cromwell is on that. So, you know, on an officially a daily basis, you know, is it, true, goes is, it, back. is it true about the monkey? You know, that's the question on a virtually a daily back. basis. <laughs> it goes back to my point about if you don't get them young, you don't get them at all. Why do people still re talk about the Ladybird book? Well, because they've had nothing since then to overlay it in their education. What do we what do we go back to when we're struggling to find something we understand? Well, it's what you learned as a child, isn't it? And if what you learned as a child was related, was simply something out of a Ladybird book and nothing at school came along and overlaid that with a more uh, nuanced and a more um, thoughtful view of this period, then it does rather argue, doesn't it? If that's what people are coming into the museum with and saying, this is what I know, then it really does argue for a real, um, overhaul of historical education, to my mind, to say, I, just a minute, you know, why are we learning about the Tudors all the time? I why aren't we learning people about people. this period? Because if you don't get them young, seems like we don't get them. And that's kind of like a filing system in your head, I always think. If you, when you, you pick up all these historical facts later in life, you can't avoid it, but you need somewhere to file them in your head. Exactly. You, know, yeah. you need something to connect them to. And if you've got your basic knowledge of Henry VIII and his six wives or whatever, you've got somewhere to put your Tudor things that you pick up in films and everything. But I mean, your point about the Cromwell film with Richard Harris do it is a really interesting one. And I would say, hopefully, to the multitude of broadcasters and commissioners who are clearly going to watch this video, um, that, you know, when, when you do, when someone does make, take the story of this period straight on, which they do with the Cromwell film, there's not a witchcraft lens, there's not a horror lens. Yes, he's, in, he's, he's, he's inflated in lots of ways, but it is a straight political biography film. When you take this period on its own terms like that, boy, do you leave a lasting impression and change everyone's mind. So, you know, we need to make another Cromwell film. Mm. But, um, but that was made, I mean, what was it, 1970? 1970, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think it comes back to, to the point I made yeah. Uh, initially, is that you know we talk about changing the history curriculum or how we teach history as well, but it's not just about that, because entwined with this is that religious stuff, mm. and religious knowledge in 1970, even if it was just you know through listening to the vibe, would have been far deeper in 1970 than it would now. So mm. I think would people's knowledge of Parliament and the yes. constitution and, and, and various other matters and perhaps a greater engagement with party politics so we still have that fundamental problem uh when it comes to a serious engagement with it of uh of, of this lack of vocabulary uh, of, of of this mm. lack of of the fundaments that are there in this period and i don't know how you change that so I, I think I would say going from what I think is a really important and, and serious point, Paul, that you've just made, and I agree 100 percent with, um, to the ridiculous, which is also, also to say that I do think visually we find people with long flowing locks and great big boots and a lot of lace quite hard to take seriously. I mean, I can <laughs> quite see why people are tempted to sort of over egg the pudding. Mm. Now, one might say, well, why doesn't that happen with the Tudors? And yes, but if you think about it, the Tudors, there's an awful lot of codpiece jokes with the Tudors, isn't it? Uh -huh. Go back 100 years before and the medieval with uh, ladies with their very long hats and their veils or Blackadder with his incredibly long pointed toes. You know, these are the, the, the visual accoutrements of periods that can make or break a, 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 um, an explanation or a film or, or something that people become so so uh, engaged with what they're seeing rather than what they're hearing. And I think sometimes the message can be lost. So I do think, and, and you may disagree with me, all of you, and that's fine. And maybe this is a trivial point, but I do think that men with very long flowing locks are quite hard to take seriously. No, I think really well right. acted and they've got a great script because, because it's so alien to us. And wigs as yes. well. It's not a silly wigs. point at all. Wigs as well is a really tricky one, isn't it? You know, why, yeah. why, are, they, why are they running around with their tight, short shaved hair with fleas in and then a wig on top? And I completely agree. It's not a silly point at all. All this lace flowing out over the tops of their boots, which of course people tend to exaggerate. 
I, I think there is, I think it just is another visual hurdle that people have got to get over mm. before they can actually engage with the the character yeah. as a person and the ideas that that character is embodying. And I do think that doesn't help. Now, of course, the answer to that is, well, don't overdo the costumes. <laughs> Why do people overdo the costumes? Well, sometimes because actually they're being historically accurate. They were overdone. And sometimes because they just, I don't know, they've got too much budget in the costume sort of um, coffers or something. The answer also maybe, I think, uh, to be facetious, is to set more things in the 1650s because it's not like sport being clean shaven was, yeah. was the, was the um, fashion. And actually, you don't get the pointy beards and quite the long flowing locks. I mean, there, there is longish, as Paul you know, would say, there's longish hair and collar, collar touching hair and stuff because, you know, the longer hair was a sign of nobility. But they're all actually, you know, quite clean, clean shaven. And the wigs don't come in until 59, 60. I mean, 57, Francis Cromwell's young bridegroom husband, Robert Rich, who's a real dandy and known for being a dandy at the court, wears a wig, a periwig at their wedding, the wig that Cromwell drunkenly snatches off his head and sits on. Um, and that, that that is a huge sort of uh, thing and a sign of this young man's dandyishness that he's wearing a wig in 57. So we've got our little narrow window of the protectorate to get in our clean shaven men with slightly shorter hair and without wigs where we can set, set good films. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, mean, I, I think that's probably a good note to draw uh, draw to close our discussion. And I, I mean, I, I think the basis of that, at least, there is some hope, as Paul says. You know that um, you know there is a huge amount of material coming out, and uh, you know, the, the, as you say, things like Robert Harris's novel and a huge amount of public material at the moment, and it is gradually starting to trickle down to other things on television and so on. So. Fingers crossed that continues and we will all keep plugging away and supporting each other in the meantime. So thank you ever so much for your time this afternoon, folks. That's been absolutely fascinating thank and, you. Um, uh, uh, you know, a really interesting discussion. And I suspect one, as uh, Paul and I said when we were meeting yesterday, probably could go on for, for many hours and days to come. But, uh, but thank you ever so much for your time. Much appreciated. Well, I hope you enjoyed that um, as much as we did uh, recording that particular conversation. We actually talked for quite a lot one time afterwards about various issues as well. So it's one that obviously is uh, got a lot of people who are interested in this period very passionate. Um, if you did enjoy that, please remember to like this video and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We're now also on Instagram as well. Uh, you can also donate to the museum should you wish to do so, and you'll find details of our online shop on our website as well. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for uh, watching this video, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.